Good evening, all. Uh, welcome to week 20 uh, of GB311. Uh, last week, we heard from Professor Simon Hicks, who is um, our lecturer this evening and head of the government department, about uh, Britain and Europe and some of the complex story, and it is a complex story, of how Britain joined Europe or joined the European Community, European Union, and the complexities of that relationship. What we're going to hear more about this week is the way in which that complexity affects the ongoing debate about what the British want out of Europe, how Britain affects Europe, how Europe affects Britain. That's it. Thanks, Tony. Um, there's a seat down here if you want one. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about where I think the EU is heading, given what has happened over the last couple of years, um, and why that is important for understanding Britain's relationship to the rest of the EU. I'll then set out several options for Britain that are currently being discussed. Um, I will then talk about some of the current positions of the British parties and a little bit on British public opinion from some YouGov data and I'll say a bit about likely outcome of the May European Parliament elections which I think will have an impact on the debate uh, particularly within the Conservative Party. So my general view of the EU, if some of you have read some of the stuff I've written recently on this most of the 1980s and 90s was spelt, spent building the single market, which is building a, a market on a continental scale and a set of institutions in Brussels for regulating that market. So, you know, a unique supranational market, the world's largest market of 500 million people, um, and a set of institutions to govern it, i.e. to pass common regulations and rules. The project was a very British project, backed by all the other member states, what has happened with the crisis in the Eurozone is the EU is embarking on a new project, if you like, within the Eurozone plus the member states that are likely to join the Euro in the next five to ten years. And we can think about this as building deeper macroeconomic integration, having built a microeconomic union. And it's uh, macroeconomic integration amongst the 18 members of the Euro plus the six or more member states that are likely to join. Um, and the architecture is already starting to take place. So we have a European stability mechanism, which is a bailout fund. We have a fiscal compact treaty, which 26 member states, everybody except the UK and the Czech Republic, have signed. Uh, we have a Euro Plus Pact, which is a set of rules uh, to harmonise national macroeconomic policies. We now have a set of rules governing a banking union, where banks will be centrally regulated by the European Central Bank and they can be the right to be a bank and we be withdrawn by the European Central Bank and the ECB developing a new role as a lender of last resort, although challenged in the German Constitutional Court and a referral to the European Court of Justice. But this is fundamentally different. This architecture is fundamentally different to uh, how the EU was up until this point. Um, and this is a compromise deal between Northern European states who are willing to bail out southern European member states to protect the euro in return for the southern European member states fundamentally transforming their public finances and coordinating their macroeconomic policies, pensions policies, retirement policies, minimum wage policies, you name it, um, as a price for the sustainability of the euro. So something fundamentally different is happening in the EU. So this is what the EU looks like right now. So the blue here is the Eurozone. The yellow are the member states that are likely to join. Sweden has a constitutional commitment to join, although had a referendum in 2003. 56 voted against joining. Denmark and the UK are the only two member states that formally have an opt-out, although Denmark has its currency pegged to the Euro, and there's an ongoing discussion in Denmark. The current government would like Denmark to join the Euro. Um, Lithuania is outside the euro, also currency pegged to the euro. And then you've got some, mem some states even outside the EU who currently use the euro, which I find quite interesting if you think about Scotland leaving the UK and saying that it would be our free choice to use the pound, you can't stop us. Well, they're, they're states that are outside the EU just using the euro and there's nothing the euro can do about it. This is the architecture that's been signed. Here are the 18 existing eurozone states. They've signed up to this European stability mechanism. 
This is a treaty that says that every member state must have a balanced budget and sign up to these common fiscal rules. Every member state, apart from Czech Republic in the UK, plus Croatia, a new one who's just joined, have not signed it. They're likely to sign it. This is the Euro Plus Pact, which is coordinating national macroeconomic policies. 18 member states of the Eurozone, plus all these, except Sweden, Croatia, Czech Republic in the UK. And a banking union in, currently in process that has every member state except Sweden and the UK. In fact, the UK is the only member state that has not signed up to any of these. So the idea that the UK could be the leader of the outs is just nonsense. The UK is the only member state that is an out. Everybody's in in some way. So in a sense, we've got three categories of states now in the e EU. We've got the Eurozone states who've signed up to everything. We've got all the other member states that have signed up to at least one or more of the bits of the architecture that's being built. And then we've got the UK, right? So it's a very particular relationship for the UK and a very challenging position for the UK. And which, who, whoever was governing in Westminster would be facing exactly this same problem. So Nigel Lawson put it, uh, an article I think in the Telegraph, and he's, a letter in the Telegraph, and he said, uh, the what people don't seem to understand is that the, the question for Britain is, is it better to be isolated inside the EU or isolated outside the EU? <laughs> that's the challenge. Options for Britain, join the Euro. Well, that's not going to happen, but that, see, that's the kind of option that Denmark is considering, faced with being in a similar sort of situation, and Sweden. The status quo, i.e., we're in the single market, they're building deeper economic and monetary union, we'll just carry on as we are and we don't need to worry about this, we'll just pretend that this is fine, that's the position of the Lib Dems. Um, and then there's two options of a reform of the EU, which in number 10 they call mine the gap and widen the channel, which is a very British way of discussing these issues. Mind the gap is, um, let's have some safeguards for the UK within the current architecture of the EU. Some special safeguards for the UK, for example, a protocol attached to the treaties. Widen the channel is to say, let's actually make the UK have a really special relationship, a completely different relationship to the rest of the EU, to all the other member states. Um, some particular UK, even more UK opt-outs, social policy, fisheries, free movement of persons, and so on. The fifth option is exit. And we can think about two possible alternatives. If you did exit, Norway, which I talked a bit about last week, which is the European economic area, which I call the Puerto Rico of the EU, i.e. they have to sign up to everything and they have no say over what gets done. Um, and Switzerland, the Swiss option, um, a series of bilateral agreements with the EU. And this, of course, is what UKIP would like, but I'll come back to that. On these uh, Swiss and Norwegian options, there was a very interesting report from the Foreign Affairs Committee in the House of Commons on tw in 2013 on future of the EU and the members of the committee went off and spoke to the members of the Norwegian and Swiss parliaments and they said the following in the report. Our witnesses and interlocutors also brought home to us the essential similarity between the positions of Norway and Switzerland, namely that both are in, in practice obliged to adopt EU legislation over which they have had no effective say. On our visits to Oslo and Bern, we gained the impression that both Norway and Switzerland were prepared to accept what they acknowledged to be a democratic deficit as the price for their continued access to parts of the single market. However, our interlocutors in both Bern and Oslo largely advised the EU UK to remain inside the EU as a way of retaining influence over the legislation that would be obliged to adopt if it remained part of the single market. So there's a, did I use the example of the US last week? I think I did, didn't I? No, the, the, the cosmetics directive? No? Yes, you did, you did, you okay, did, yes, you I already did. mentioned that last week. Well, there's your example. If you, leave, if you leave the EU and you want to trade with the EU and get access to the single market, you're going to have to accept everything, the full kit and caboodle of the EU regulatory framework. The US has to accept it. Norway and Switzerland have to accept it. So why not stay in and be at the top table and be a big state influencing this stuff, <coughs> much bigger than Norway and Switzerland, and being able to influence then the rules that will govern the market. There's another nice analogy, which is the trucks. Did I talk about this last week? No, trucks. So one thing going through the EU right now is a new piece of legislation on the shape of cabs of lorries. Cabs of lorries, um, the 
green lobby in Brussels and including our London mayor, who's been to Brussels and lobbied for this as well, a good environmentalist that he is, um, is lobbying for the truck's shapes to be changed, the windows, so that they're much lower so truck drivers can see cyclists. And they reckon that there's evidence from some of the places in the world that have adopted these rules that this reduces road accidents, i.e. trucks hitting cyclists. If trucks hit cyclists, they die. Uh, it reduces road deaths. This is being passed through Brussels at the moment. If it gets passed, it will become the global truck standard. So you can imagine Britain could leave the EU, and then we'd be free and fully sovereign to decide the shapes of cabs on our trucks. Except we wouldn't. We'd have to accept whatever the EU does, because our truck manufacturers would have to sell to the rest of the single market. Just as a nice example. So why can't we reform the treaties? And this, of course, was Cameron's favourite thing to go around saying, we want a reform of the treaties. Well, there's two different types of treaty revision procedure now in the Lisbon Treaty. One known as the ordinary revision procedure and one the simplified revision procedure. The ordinary re revision procedure um, is the standard way up to now that treaties, the treaties have been reformed. Any member state, the European Parliament or the Commission can say, we'd like to reform the treaties. The European Council, that's the heads of government, can then convene either a full-blown convention with representatives from national parliaments and the European Parliament, which we had for the created what ended up being the Lisbon Treaty. We had a convention. Or an intergovernmental conference, which is just a conference of representatives from the governments. What the outcome of the convention or the IGC is then agreed unanimously by the heads of government and then ratified in every member state, quote, in accordance with their respective constitutional arrangements, which means by national parliamentary vote and or referendum. And there will be lots of referendums if you ever tried to reform the treaties. And with 28 member states, it just takes one member state in a referendum to say no and it's dead. So, yeah, let's reform the treaties and get rid of ever closer union and get that ratified through referendums in every member state. Yeah, good idea. It's not going to happen. The simplified revision procedure, though, which is clever, and Britain actually opposed it when it was introduced, or when it was being discussed, because they said, we don't want this, because it would allow the EU to reform the treaties very easily without it going through national ratification. In fact, now this is something the Brits like, because they think, actually, they might be able to get reform of the treaties in a way to help Britain. Proposals to amend part three of the treaty, i.e. the bit of the treaty that just touches the, e the, the functioning of the single market, in effect, not common foreign security policy, not um, policing, justice and home affairs, and not the f early preamble parts of the treaty, again submitted by a member state, i.e. Britain, European Parliament or the Commission. Amendments cannot increase the competencies of the EU, so this procedure cannot be used to expand the powers of the EU. Again, heads of government have to make the final decision, and you have ratification of this, usually just through a vote in a national parliament. This is how the treaties were reformed recently to introduce the, Euro the European Stability Mechanism, the EU bailout fund under Economic and Monetary Union. So this is a potential way of reforming some bits of the treaty to help the UK, for example, adding a protocol to the treaties or amending some other elements of the treaty, but not to get rid of the ever closer union phrase, which the Brits don't like or some British people don't like. To do that, you'd have to go through that procedure. The other thing that's been going on recently which plays into this debate is the, this government launched a balance of competences review. So this they thought was a clever ruse to get British civil servants to go through every area of the UK treaties to allow everybody to come and talk to them and then to write uh, various reports and say the EU is doing way too much and we need to scale back what the EU does. So run by the cabinet office Foreign Office, every Ministry of State has got submissions from business, interest groups, NGOs, pro-European camp, anti-European camp, private citizens, anybody can feed into this. There's been 14 reports so far. You can go to the government's website and download them. 14 reports by policy area, 14 out of 32. One report on the free movement of persons has been shelved or delayed was meant to be released in February 2014. It's been delayed because the result of the report did not, Theresa May didn't like what the report was going to say, which allegedly was going to say that there's been actually very little effect of the 
open borders to Central and Eastern Europe. In fact, very few of them are uh, consuming um, benefits and many, almost all of them are in work and contributing uh, taxes. The main conclusion, the main punchline of these 14 reports that have been released so far is that the balance of competencies, the balance between what the UK does and what the EU does in a given policy area is more or less appropriate, i.e. the balance of competencies on competition policy, where the EU makes competition policy decisions, where the UK makes competition policy decisions. The balance on environmental legislation, where the EU makes sets European environment standards where the UK sets its own separate environment standards. If you're regulating a single market, you need environmental standards to be set overwhelmingly centrally in Brussels, right? So you've got the British government, the ministries of the state officially saying the balance of competences so far that we've looked at them are more or less okay. And then the British government is going around to every other member state and say, we want reform, we want reform, we want reform. And lo and behold, Merkel is saying, yeah, how come your ministries are saying Everything's okay. There's a kind of contradiction here, isn't there? So it's only purely politics. You're playing a political game. In fact, in practice, your own civil servants are telling you that everything's fine. So this is the kind of background to the parties then trying to develop their own positions. And we've seen Cameron just this week set out in a bit more detail what, the conservative, what his position is for Britain in Europe in response to Miliband who did it last week. So I'm going to talk about, talk about Cameron first and then Miliband, but what you can see with what Cameron has done here is in response in a sense to Miliband. So Cameron had this speech in Bamberg which I talked a bit about last week, January 2013, and he called for reform of the EU to make the EU more democratic, a new reform agenda for the EU to uh, more deregulate even further the single market, bring the Europe closer to the citizens, he didn't make anything more specific on any of those issues, but he did promise an in-out referendum in 2017 if the Conservatives get a majority at the next election. Everybody since then has been saying, what exactly are you going to ask for? What really are you going to ask for? And so there's been various groups within the party with some of the uh, more Eurosceptic Conservatives campaigning and saying, um, we want repatriation of or in other words, opt-outs of whole swathes of EU policy. We want the phrase ever closer union removed from the treaties because this commits the EU to deeper and deeper integration and nobody wants that. We want, the backbenchers are also saying, we want national parliaments to be able to veto any EU law that gets passed. Can you imagine, even William Hague, the foreign secretary said, can you imagine if every other member state asked for that as well? Then we'd have gridlock. And most of actually what the Britain wants is reform of the single market. And guess what? It's the French who are most opposed to any more liberal reform of the single market. Give, their nas give the French National Assembly a veto over that and it's not going to happen. So in response to this, he wrote in the Sunday Telegraph, seven demands, he called it. Longer transitions on free movement of people from new member states. Really, this means Serbia. They're the next member state that would join where there would be transition arrangements. Um, current transition arrangements can last up to seven years. He's thinking further down the line, eventually, if Turkey joins, we'll have transition arrangements for 107 years, perhaps. Um, <laughs> curbs on Social Security from, for migrants from existing EU member states. There are no curbs. It's the treaties commit the EU to the free movement of labour through secondary legislation and European <coughs> Court of Justice rulings. This has been essentially extended to all citizens' rights. So if you're a, an EU citizen in any EU member state, you can go and work and live and consume the same kind of benefits that any citizens have from any other member states, whether that's healthcare or pensions or education or, what, or the like. He's discussing the possibility, he'd like the other member states to raise the issue of delaying or introducing a longer time period when um, uh, migrants from other member states are allowed to uh, get any kind of social benefits, perhaps six months or even a year. He wants a new system of red cards where for national parliaments to block proposed EU laws. This would be done not by one national parliament. So currently EU legislation is proposed by the Commission. It goes to the European Parliament and the Council and at the same time goes to national parliaments National Parliament scrutinise this legislation and they can raise what they call a yellow card, which means the Commission has to consider 
whether this legislation is in breach of subsidiarity as a principle or proportionality as a principle. Subsidiarity, i.e., is it appropriate for the EU to be doing this? Proportionality, meaning is the amount of what the EU is proposing appropriate for the task? Um, so national parliaments have the, the ability under the current treaties to police subsidiarity and proportionality. He would like a system of red cards, meaning if you have several national parliaments saying, we don't want this, it is automatically dropped. It's not up to the Commission just to review it. He wants a commitment to more deregulation in the single market, particularly services sector. Germany is most opposed. He wants faster agreement on free trade agreements, particularly with the US. And he wants some kind of way that the ever closer union commitment in the treaty should not apply to the UK. This is difficult because it would require treaty reform to be ratified by all other member states. And he wants some demand of some vague commitment, more power to flow away from Brussels rather than to Brussels. This is seen as a, I don't want Jean-Claude Juncker as commission president. But you have to read between the lines to figure that out. And he wants, this is, I find, quite deliberately misleading. These are his demands to the EU. Is unnecessary interference from the European Court of Human Rights. Now, what's funny about that? The European Court of Human Rights has absolutely nothing to do with the EU. It's the Council of Europe. The Council of Europe. Uh, the court of the Council of Europe has nothing to do with the EU. So everyone's moaning about Europe interfering through the courts. The European Court of Human Rights. In fact, in the uh, assembly of the European, of the Council of Europe, the British Conservatives sit with United Russia. Isn't that hilarious? They sit with United Russia and a bunch of other crazy people because they refuse to sit with the centre-right. Uh, they refuse to sit with Merkel and, and the French centre-left and the Italian centre-left and the Spanish centre-left. They sit with Putin... And, and a bunch of other crazy people. It's really fascinating. Um, these you can read as efforts to set out demands that, would, that he could come home and say, we've, if we get most of these things, uh, we have renegotiated the terms of Britain's relationship with Europe, and then we can have a referendum. Um, and he could do most of these things without treaty reform. Longer transition periods, that could just be bilateral agreements whenever there's a new member state joining. Curbs on Social Security benefits, this could be a directive that gets passed. The Commission would have to initiate it. Red cards, this could be done through some kind of protocol or agreement amongst the heads of government. This is a commitment that would re re require the Commission to do these sorts of things. That's more tricky. What does that mean? That's got nothing to do with the EU. So he could do most of these things without any treaty reform. Uh, perhaps a UK protocol, a protocol attached to the treaty. I've heard a few people say this sort of thing. Something that says, agreed by the member states through some simple ratification procedure that says, the UK is special, the UK has a special relationship with Brussels, we love the UK, we know that you are special, and this ever close union doesn't apply to you, and, um, and so on. And then he can come home and say, I have a special protocol. Miliband made a speech last week. I believe our country's future lies in the EU. That's about the most pro-European thing he said in the speech. And then he went on and said he wants reform of the EU, re economic reform. And he talked about the single market. He wants liberalisation of the single market as a good socialist. Uh, he wants to get rid of the cap. He wants more free trade. Um, he wants longer transition periods, greater than seven years, more discretion for member states on whether they apply benefits. He wants national parliaments to block EU laws through a system, for example, of red cards. He wants Britain's opt out from ever closer. It just sounds funny, doesn't it? The Cameron and Miliband basically have an identical position on what they're asking for. And he says a new lock. No transfer of powers without an in-out referendum, which the funniest thing I saw was a tweet from um, Alexander Stubb, former LSE PhD student, now the Finnish European Affairs Minister, former Finnish Foreign Minister, spoke at the LSE a few weeks ago, potential future high representative, representative for foreign affairs of the EU. He tweeted immediately after this, with all these locks in Britain now, let's hope nobody loses the keys, which I thought was quite funny. <laughs> After Miliband's speech, Simon Usherwood at Surrey did a nice little study of headlines of the papers 
and looked at how they portrayed it. So this was uh, just numbers of headlines the day after. Um, two said there will be no, there will be a referendum. Miliband has committed us to a referendum. T 16 said there won't be a referendum. 15 said a referendum is now very unlikely. Seven didn't even mention a referendum and said Miliband sets out a new policy. And then 14 were talking about something completely different. So the general sense is Miliband and Cameron have asked for exactly the same thing. Cameron has said, if I get it, we have a referendum. Miliband has said, we're only going to have a referendum if new powers are transferred to Brussels. Or if there's a new treaty that transfers Brussels, then we'll have this in-out referendum. So if, if these reforms come without treaty reforms, it's not clear from what Miliband has said whether he would, has committed us to a referendum or not. The Lib Dems are officially the party of in. We love the EU, roll over and tickle our tummies. We do have no demands. We think everything is fine. They would like free market reform of the single market, especially liberalization of services. Um, they are committed to a referendum on a new treaty if the new treaty transfers more powers to Brussels, but it wouldn't be an in-out referendum. It would just be a standard referendum on a treaty, which the UK is already committed to under the EU bill that was passed in 2011. The UK Independence Party wants a referendum now, and it wants an immediate referendum now, and it will hold a gun to people's head if they vote yes to stay in. They want to leave. It's like Crimea. Anyway. There will be two head-to-head -head debates between Clegg and Farage. This is quite interesting in that both of them, I think, will benefit hugely. Um, they're not competing with each other for voters. Um, they both have quite clear positions on Europe. Lib Dem's the most pro-European party at the moment. UKIP, clearly the most anti-European, Conservatives and Labour somewhere between these two positions, and both Lib Dems and UKIP competing with Labour and Conservatives for their voters, but not competing with each other for voters. So they could both benefit from these public debates. This was the Let Britain Decide campaign poster that was tweeted immediately after Miliband's speech. Labour and the Lib Dems won't give you a say. UKIP can't give you a say. Only the Conservatives can and will give you a referendum on Europe. If you want a referendum on Europe, vote Conservative at the next elect general election to get a ma Conservative majority in the House of Commons, heaven forbid, and then we'll have a referendum. But in the midst of all this, the public has suddenly decided we're perhaps not quite as anti-European as we were a few years ago. Fascinating. The more we talk about Europe, the more the public goes, hmm, actually, maybe we're not quite as anti-European as we thought. So this is the rolling YouGov poll tracker um, on the leave or remain in the EU question. 2012, December 2012, that was the peak of kind of anti-European sentiment, um, where there was just over 50% saying they'd like to leave the EU. <laughs> It collapsed, came up a little bit again, came back down again. Currently, in the latest tracker, which was in March, <coughs> ironically, the week a few days before Miliband's speech, there's now straight in the latest YouGov polls, 41. If there was an in-out referendum now on the status quo, the current EU as it is now, the current relationship of Britain to the EU as it is now, would you want to leave? 39% yes, 41% no, we'll stay. Actually, more coverage on the continent of the results of this poll than there was in the UK, interestingly. And Merkel noticed and reminded the government. Um, so this was a separate poll on a, uh, the, the, where they asked, um, this was about six months ago, and they asked, well, what if we had a vote now? So this was the 45-32, vote to leave, vote to stay. What if there was a modest re renegotiation 39 vote to stay, 38 vote to leave. What if there was a major renegotiation? What if the government and the parties could come in and try and convince you they've got a major new deal for Britain, clear majority in favour of staying in the EU as opposed to 23% leaving? And when, in the same survey, they tried to ask the voters, identify the swing voters in the general election, which of course are the voters that the Labour, Labour and Conservative are competing for, this is the, what 
given them a list of questions, tick how many of these things you feel are of the mo utmost importance should Britain agree to renegotiate these things. So when Britain goes in to renegotiate with the rest of Europe, which of these things do you think is the utmost important? 61% said limits on migrants. My Polish builder is fine, but we don't want anyone else having them. Um, discretion on migrant benefits, 46. Reduced money the UK pays, 43. Fewer regulations on business, 37. Freer trade with non-EU countries, mainly the US. Greater control of fisheries. Uh, relaxation of human rights law. It's got nothing to do with the EU, but anyway. Um, scrap the European Parliament in Strasbourg. Devolve powers over employment law. Reform the cap. Interestingly, the Conservatives have stopped talking about reforming the cap, and it's nothing to do with the fact that farmers are bankrolling them. Europe is not that important, though, to most voters. It really isn't. If you watch British politics, you'd think that's all we ever talk about. It's all I ever talk about, but I'm mad. What are the most important issues facing the country? 60, so, and you're allowed to mention up to three. There's a list of about 20 in the YouGov polls. You can name up to three. 60% on average of the voters, this was the most recent poll, 10th, 10th of 11th of March. Um, economy, immigration, interestingly, health, welfare, Europe. 16% of voters think it's an important issue. 16%. 84% of voters did not mention it as one of the three most important issues they think the country is facing. It varies considerably by party, and this is what's interesting. Conservative voters, number one, economy, number two, immigration, number three, welfare benefits, number four, Europe. 25% of conservative voters said Europe. Labour voters, only 18%. 17% said Europe, um, overtaken by, sorry, less, much less, 10% uh, said Europe. They think education and housing is more important than Europe for Labour voters. So it's interesting that Miliband is now talking about Europe. It's not important to, to people who are saying they're going to vote Labour at the next election. For Lib Dems, they're all university professors, so they say education is the most important. Um, or students, I guess. Uh, uh, Health is important, economy is by far the most important, Europe is not very important. And if you're a UKIP voter, it's only the fourth most important issue for UKIP voters. The most important issue for UKIP voters is immigration. Right? And UKIP has been very clever to combine the issues of immigration and Europe. My parents live in Sussex. When I drive down to see them, there's a huge UKIP banner on the road down to Brighton. And the UKIP poster says, I wish I should have brought a photo of it, says, um, say no to Europe, enough is enough. Ah, oh, that's really clever. So, too much Europe, but also too many immigrants without saying it, right? So, immigration number one, economy number two, Europe three, welfare scroungers four, health five, and nobody, they don't seem to care about housing or education. These are the European Parliament election polls. There was a poll yesterday, or Sunday, uh, a Comres poll that really is through the cat amongst the pigeons. And they, it's a slightly different survey sample to the other polls. So up until this point, these are two YouGov polls. This is ICM. And suddenly Comres have just done this. Uh, but this standing, so Labour were looking like they're going to win the European Parliament elections. UKIP would probably beat the Conservatives, but it would be close. The Conservatives would come third, potentially, which would be the first time since universal suffrage the Conservatives come third in a national election. Now, the latest poll in Comres, they have a new, a new question. On a scale from 1 to 10, what's the probability you're going to vote? And they only count in their survey people who said 10 on the scale. And if you only look at people who are absolutely convinced they're going to vote in these elections, UKIP wins. Labour comes second, Conservatives third. If this happens, this would be hugely dramatic for the Conservatives because that would be enormous pressure on Cameron because if UKIP get, they won't get anything like 30% in a general election, but if they get 10% in a general election, 
That's taking away conservative votes in a lot of safe conservative seats, which would let Labour win potentially a majority in the House of Commons and would be the end of Cameron. Where do we get to? Well, the EU is heading towards deeper economic and monetary union. It presents the UK with a very difficult choice. Is it better to be isolated within the EU or isolated outside the EU, as Nigel Lawson says? Conservative leadership and the Labour leadership and the majority of the public want some new relationship for Britain and in, Euro in Europe. If they can get it, they would probably want to put it to a referendum and would campaign for an in. And given current opinion polls, the public would probably vote to stay, vote to accept that new relationship. But how much are they likely to get? They're not likely to get very much. Um, they're not likely to get the widening the channel as an option. They're more likely to get the mind the gap, i.e. a few little safeguards for Britain, perhaps a UK protocol. The anti-Europeans and the Conservative Party would say this is not enough. We want opt-outs. We want repatriation. We want not to be covered by ever closer union and so on. But we've seen, interestingly, a convergence <coughs> excuse me, in the demands of Cameron and Miliband on some limits on the free movement of people, particularly limits on welfare benefits, some way to say ever close union doesn't apply to the UK, perhaps in a protocol, and a commitment from the Commission and the other EU member states to reform the single market in a more liberal direction, particularly the services sector, which is generating most new jobs in a modern economy. The big difference between the parties, though, is on the referendum commitment. The Conservatives are saying there will be, they want a referendum regardless of the outcome of any negotiations between London and Brussels. They want, to com they want a referendum. And partly this is a commitment to the British people, but partly it's a commitment to the other member states to say, you better give us something because we're going to have a referendum regardless. If you want us to stay, give us something now so that we can go to the public with a referendum. Miliband is saying, we'll only have a referendum if this new settlement is agreed. And then he'd be willing to put it to the public in a referendum. A new deal for Britain, as he calls it. There Thank you very much. <coughs> right. Um, right. Thank you, Simon. I mean... What you've described this week and to some extent last week is a continuous struggle, isn't it? It's, a, it's an endless, it's like something out of, or it's like George Orwell's version of the need for enemies. I mean, that countries need to create external forces. Now, this isn't a war by war, this is a war by other means, by diplomacy and within a structure. But in the end, rather like the relationship between. Um, Lon Scotland and London, the relationship between London and Europe is one where, in a sense, you could easily argue that, in this case, the British need Europe, something to continue to fight against, to see as a, an enemy, an external enemy. But more controversially, in some ways, you could argue, could you not, that the Europeans need Britain with its slightly quirky ways, keeping them in line, stopping them becoming too Euro-Federalist, which many of their own other members don't really want. So is Britain a corrective to the Euro-fanaticism of those who really want European integration? There's growing views um, on the continent to say de Gaulle was probably right. Britain's never going to be committed to European integration. And if the real challenge right now is to build a new architecture to fix the euro, and Britain is a thorn in the side of that project. And it's Britain's problem. The relationship between Britain and the EU is Britain's problem. It's not Brussels' problem. If Britain decides to stay in, then it should stay in with a commitment not to derail what the rest of us are trying to do. And if Britain decides to leave, then fine, it will leave and we can just get on with what we have to do. And that's grow there's growing support for that. Poland, it's amazing to see the transition in the view of Poland. 
Poland was used to be very supportive of Britain. Britain campaigned vigorously for the new member states to join for enlargement of the EU. <coughs> Britain was one of the few member states to give full free movement rights to citizens from Central and Eastern Europe. Poland politically was an ally of Britain, a very Atlanticist, very pro-British, seen as a balance against Germany and France. And two things have really upset Poland. One, moaning about new immigrants from Central and Eastern Europe, mostly from Poland, with the Poles saying, wait a second, we came and have built all your houses and looked after all your children and cleaned all your houses and, and none, no, our citizens in Britain are really good citizens working and paying taxes, they're not benefit scroungers, yet you're going around saying that they are and you don't want them. So, you know, that really upsets Poland. And Poland really felt torn when Cameron went to that summit meeting on the Fiscal Compact Treaty and essentially let Poland down uh, by demanding um, Poland was torn between Berlin and London and put in the invidious position of, of having to choose between Berlin and, and London and London was convinced that Poland was not going to sign the Fiscal Compact Treaty and they did and that shows you, the, you know, that they've tied their colours very much to the mast of a sort of Franco-German engine driving Europe yeah. forward. So they used to be a natural, the Dutch are another similar position, they had their own balance of competences review very similar to the British one. They came up with a whole lot of proposals on red cards and green cards for national parliaments, which the Brits kind of like and have taken from the Dutch. Um, but everything else, the Dutch have basically said, we don't particularly have a problem with this. We're in the Euro, so we see we need this new architecture for the Euro, and we don't see that necessarily as a fundamental sovereignty challenge to the Netherlands. So, so I, I think a lot of people look at Britain and don't really understand what all the fuss is about. Right, OK, I could pursue that. Well, I, let me just take one... Let me go back on the Euro question. I mean, Britain's scepticism about the Euro, you could argue, had the other countries not decided to go ahead with the Euro, life would have been easier for the EU as a whole than creating the Euro. I mean, it's too I mean, early to say... That's a very Anglo-Saxon take. Well, no, but it has been the EU's most difficult time, hasn't yes, it? Yes, but you could say... The Euro has a, been its most there's difficult there's time. But there's a difference between saying there shouldn't have been a Euro and saying Greece and Italy and Portugal <coughs> shouldn't have been allowed into the Euro. I think there are definitely people on the continent saying that. Yeah. It was a mistake to let in Greece. Perhaps but that's the point I'm making, that no, the, the Euro federalism took them that far. If they'd allowed the sort of sensible scepticism to have fed through into their decision making, they'd have ended up with a better euro. That's the point I'm making. Yes, it's a, but it, you're right in that if it was purely just an economic project, it would have made sense not to let those states in. The fact that they let some of those in suggests that it was more than that, it was a political project. And that's one thing I think the Brits have never really grasped. For a lot of the continent, for a lot of the elites on the continent and the masses on the continent, it is fundamentally a political project. It's not just about a single market. It's about creating a political union. And that's not a kind of loony, mad federalist idea. This is about collective security in a dangerous, globalizing world so Europe can punch its weight globally, negotiate with America, bargain with China, and, have, and be able to make sure there's peace forever on the continent of Europe. And if you live on the continent, my sister lives in Holland, I used to live in Brussels, if you live on the continent, there's no borders, you drive, you don't, it feels qualitatively different in a sense. You feel part of a political organisation, a political community that is very different. And so it, it's a political project. At heart, it's a political project. Britain has never signed up to a political project. We signed up to a common market. Yep. Okay, right, any questions? Yeah. I don't necessarily accept that analysis. Uh, the question was, if, if the real choice is isolated in Europe, isolated on the inside or isolated on the outside, then whether we're in or out doesn't particularly matter, so why is the referendum so important? Um, I think it does matter, because I think there's two views about what I painted as where the EU is heading. One is, this is a fundamental transformation of the EU into some new, deeper political and economic union. That's a kind of more federalist take on what is happening. There's another take, which is, is from inside the finance ministry in Berlin, or um, inside the chancery in the Netherlands, or even inside the Danish government, which says, no, this is a bit of an architecture that's being built that we should have had in the Maastricht Treaty to make EMU work. It's not fundamentally transforming the EU. 
We're just fixing some of the bits of the euro, and once we've done that, we can get back to the core business, which is governing the single market. And if you think of it like that, then we're not so much isolated on the inside. We're at the top table of governing the single market. And there's other things, when you think about on that, which is one of the worries from the Lawson perspective is the, e, the Eurozone member states will caucus against us. And one of the first examples or concrete examples of that was bankers' bonuses. So we had a situation where the British government was standing up for protecting uh, bankers in London against EU law that said that they weren't, there was had to be some cap on their end of year bonuses. Previously, there was a kind of gentleman's agreement, finance ministers tended to be men, gentleman's agreement, um, that anything dealing with regulation of financial services, Britain would have to be on board because financial services overwhelmingly are concentrated in London. Um, and this was the first time there was an agreement on financial services, which can be agreed by qualified majority voting, where Britain voted no and lost, and it was passed. And it's the first time that they really saw Britain on the losing side of a clear majority, and the majority on the other side was Eurozone Plus against Britain. It's an exception in that there was a lot of anger against bankers and blaming bankers for the credit crisis, but some people in the City of London and Lawson said, this is just a signal of what is to come. Um, Britain is isolated now, and they won't do business with us. Van Rompuy said, why would we negotiate with somebody whose hand is on the exit door? Um, other, I've heard from MEPs in the European Parliament. Um, uh, one MEP who uh, is very senior in the Civil Liberties Committee told me that um, she was very influ influential on the drafting of a lot of legislation on asylum and visas. And now, when she negotiates inside the Committee on Legislation, the other members of the committee say, why should we even talk to you? Because Britain is going to opt out of all this stuff anyway. So that's a kind of, you know, at the light, whether you're a commission official, an MEP, or a minister sitting in the council, it's not clear whether really you are very isolated or whether really once they get back to the core business of governing the single market, then Britain is as much a full player as everybody else. And the jury's out on that. We don't know yet. Could you again give How us How do I summarize summary? that? Um, are, are there some deeper underlying forces that relate uh, the ongoing debate in Britain about Europe to generally Britain's place in the world and how British citizens see Britain's place in the world? Is that the kind of more or less? I don't think there are. I mean, it, it, there's, a, there's a delicious irony in the, you know, the, the more post-imperial Britain becomes, the... the, the, the the less significant Britain becomes on the world stage, the more paranoid we get about Brussels and the more paranoid we get about immigrants. So <laughs> is it a symptom of Britain's decline that these now are issues? We're not a confident nation anymore. We're not a confident community anymore that now we're obsessed with these, what in the great scheme of things you might think of as relatively parochial issues. Um, I don't know. I do think that something fundamental has happened in Europe, which is really historic in importance. What we in Europe, and Britain as a role in that, has created is a new supranational political system beyond the nation state that is unique in history. It's unique. It's more federal than Britain realizes. It's more like the United States than Britain realizes. I could do my, I didn't do my, some students of mine have seen me do this anecdote but uh, you guys haven't, so I'll do it. Um, this is my US driving license, state of California. My wife's a US citizen, she's from New York. I got this when I was a visiting prof at UC. Well. So, <laughs> so she, this, in, this entitles me to drive in California and Nevada and Arizona and Oregon and Washington State, and that's it. My wife as a New Yorker had to get a new driving license in California within 18 days of arriving in California, and so did I. Regu it's a state-based driving license, bilateral recognition with other states, no federal regulation. Here's my EU driving license. This entitles me to drive in every EU member state. Um, it has the same size, same color, 
same regulations of the photo, same regulations of the information that's got to be on it, same regulations and what you have to pass in your test to get one. This is the EU regulatory state. This is the US regulatory state. This is far more integrated and federal than this is. We don't... Sorry? Yeah. So, so or this one, all American states too, but up to 18 days in California. Um, but this is, you know, you can think about other areas. Health and safety at work. Maternity and paternity leave. Uh, Non-discrimination in the workplace on the grounds of race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender, age, disability. European-wide regulations. European-wide rules. Europe has a continental scale market regulated in Brussels. Because it's the world's largest market, they're centrally regulated, and the world then has to accept those regulations as the standard. The EU has passed the REACH Directive, which is dull and didn't get much coverage in Britain. It is hugely important because it's a directive that regulates all the rules on the production and distribution of chemicals. Europe is the largest producer of chemicals and the largest consumer of chemicals. Every other producer of chemicals in the world now has to apply the European REACH Directive, including all the American producers who are now lobbying the US government to make it US domestic law, much to the chagrin of Congress. So it is actually a remarkable achievement of what we have managed to achieve in Europe. You can argue it's by stealth. It's just been done against the voters. Most other member states don't feel that. They've had referendums, debates, ratifications. In Britain, we feel this has been done by stealth because our political leaders have not really explained what has happened. We should have had a referendum on the Single European Act. We should have had a referendum on the Maastricht Treaty. We didn't. These were hugely important of constitutional significance. So I think it's about time we had a referendum in Britain to settle exactly this question. Do we want to be part of this political project or not? Let's have a referendum and decide it, because it's ultimately a political question. Come back to that in a moment. Lady at the back. Would the some, EU be some, better some, off without Britain? Some people think so. Um, there's a split. You know, there's growing opinion, particularly on the left. There's growing opinion on the left in France and even on the left in Germany, that, that what needs to happen is that a genuine political union should be built within Europe so there can be genuinely common social policies, common fiscal policies and so on. And that's impossible with Britain in the room. Um, but Scandinavian, mainstream opinion in Scandinavia, the centre-right in Germany um, and mainstream political opinion in Eastern Europe sees Britain as an important ally within the EU in terms of a counterweight to France, which tends to be uh, more corporatist, and a, a very Atlanticist and free trade, and a significant player. It's a, Britain's got a seat on the UN Security Council, which means the EU has two seats on the UN Security Council. Uh, Britain's a nuclear, you know, a nuclear power. We're, we have a big say globally. Interestingly, on the Ukraine, it was significant that Britain was not invited to be involved in the delegation that went to the Ukraine to sort out the Ukraine crisis. It was France, Germany and Poland. Britain was not invited. And this was seen as a snub to London. Ten years ago, Britain, it would have been the Troika of Britain, France and Germany, the three big international players that go uh, and negotiate. It wasn't. We weren't even invited. So already there's a discussion about whether or not, if Britain's not really committed to this, why should we involve Britain so much? Let me, I think it would be fair to say that in the last couple of weeks you put a relatively strong case which could be interpreted as being broadly in favour of Britain staying in Europe, if I can understate that slightly. But actually, if you stand back from a number of the things that you've said, actually they are rather bleak in some ways, because what you're saying is either you're in the European uh, Union or even if you're outside, you've got no choice. You just have to live by its rules. It's kind of like Finland in, in, the, time, in the time of the Soviet Union. Let's just, just, just present this at it, as its strongest. So you either you're in or you just have to, obey by, uh, you have to live by our rules. And even if you are in, there's a long way between the local place where most people live and London and a long way between that and Brussels. So if you're living in a small town in, I don't know, north of England, you've got quite a lot of trust to invest in your MEPs and the European commissioners, given that polling shows very clearly you prefer councillors to MPs. So you don't even like your own national government as much as your councillors. 
And in that world, you're a long way away from any imaginable influence on what goes on in the decisions made by this excellent set of institutions which are saving war. That's the second thing. So when you, you're kind of stuck whether you join it, whether you stay in or you leave. And on the other hand, you are in the position that, um, you know, that, that you've got very little say in it. So you can see why people might feel cut off. You can, and so my final negative thought, while well, I'm really piling them in here, is even if there were a referendum, nothing would change. Because in the end, it would be exactly the same on the day after the re referendum as the day before. So even if we voted in favour. Look, you're asking me about you know, Simon's general political philosophy about the EU. So, I mean, I set this out in a book, What's Wrong with the European Union and How to Fix It? And yes, I'm, I'm uh, pro-European, and I'd even go as far as openly say I'm a federalist. Uh, and I, I say that with no shame, in that I'm ultimately a Democrat. And I think that the EU is undemocratic right now. Yeah. I think uh, it should be far more democratic. There should be, there should be more directly elected, there should be a directly elected president. I think we should have referendums on the, the new architecture being built for economic and monetary union. I argued that recently in a book coming out. I think there should be a referendum on Britain's relationship with Europe. There's the only way you can get you know, public, popular legitimacy from building something which is really fundamentally different. And the more the elites go around pretending this is not what they've built, the more that angers me no end. The pretending that this is not important, it's not relevant, and actually we're fully sovereign, we fully, we have full ability to do everything we want. So this is why we're in such a mess on immigration, with a government saying we're going to restrict immigration and then getting to power and realising the only way they can do it is to prevent um, you know, people coming, highly skilled workers from outside Europe. This is just lying to the public. So, my general view is I'm in favour of Europe, but only if it is, there's a new agenda to make it far more democratic. I was in favour of there being rival candidates for the Commission presidency and there being an open battle, an open contest. I hope one or other of them does become the Commission president so that in five years' time they take this process far more seriously than they did this time. Um, and I think there should be a referendum in Britain once there is some kind of new relationship for Britain. And on some new relationship for Britain, I would be in favour of a protocol. And I think Britain should go to the other member states and say, look, we haven't signed up to deeper monetary union. We understand and appreciate why you want to do that. But I think it's appropriate that you recognise Britain's special relationship in the single market. So some kind of protocol that says that um, when... Uh, decisions are made in the governance of the single market, um, nothing can happen in deeper economic and monetary union that threatens uh, the overall governance of the single market. So there could be a single market protocol separate from a UK protocol. I think that's appropriate for member states that are not yet in the Euro, and I think it's appropriate to protect the interests of the City of London, which is completely legitimate in that the financial services industry is overwhelmingly concentrated in Britain. In the same way that if you're French, you want to protect French agriculture, which is very special to French interests. Financial services is very special to British interests. So I think it's not illegitimate to want that, but I think it should be done in a transparent and democratic way. So that's ultimately my view. And I think what has been created is remarkable, and I agree with you that we're, these are a long way from, from us. But I'm also of the view that people's identities are not frozen and fixed in time, and they do shift. And, and it is possible to create different sorts of identities and, and it, people would say you could never have uh, an election of a, of a European president because there's no way the Brits would ever support anyone who's not British in this contest. And I, then I like to remind people that that's exactly what the British press said about the Premier League when they started letting foreign players in. Nobody's going to support Arsenal if it's full of foreigners, they'll only support it because it's full of English people. That's just nonsense. My son who's 13 has got football teams from all over Europe, all over his world and all over his bedroom and whenever we play uh, uh, Pro Evo soccer on the, on the TV he always wants to be Bayern Munich or Real Madrid. I always want to be West Ham and he thinks I'm ridiculous but I mean it's uh, you know so identities shift, they're evolving and who thinks? You know if there's a battle for the for the European president between somebody who, who re who's a kind of European soft left liberal social democrat who happens to be Danish and a Brit who's some crazy right winger, I know which side I'm on. Uh, so, uh, you know, I don't think it, it's beyond the wit of man to think to, about political identities beyond the nation state. 
It's interesting to read the Federalist Papers, and I go back to the Federalist Papers on this, and Madison says it beautifully in the Federalist Papers. He says why he's in favour of an electoral college for choosing the President of the United States. He said, America's not ready for an election of the President, because if there was an election of a President, it wouldn't be, it would be, uh, it would be a beauty contest between each state's favourite son. All right, well, let's just so push that. But that's a good idea, but let's push that idea further, because the difference between the United States and an imaginably more sure. federal Europe is that the United States, in its general election, in its election for president and for Congress, but in its election for president, finds somebody who can represent or can make a case to represent everybody throughout those states. The whole country has to embody America. I'm intrigued why very few, you'll be able to name them if there are any, very few politicians from any of the e EU countries have ever seen it as their bounden duty to try to become a European-wide character, somebody who is liked beyond their own country, to That's make an effort to go broader. So if they stood for European president, you know, even if they, came from, if they came from Sweden, they'd be understood in Spain. If they came from Italy, they understood in Ireland. I think it's endogenous to the political process, right? I mean, you know... But it's not endogenous to individuals. True, could true. Do it, no, but they, that's exactly what Juncker and Schultz and Verhofstadt are trying to do. They're already writing their campaign literature in five or six different languages as we speak. And, the, and they're preparing to go and have live TV debates in multiple different languages. And they will speak multiple different languages. Um, and, you know, so that's already starting. It's not impossible to think that that that's a, that could happen. Um, Mrs. Lagarde. And I, it's interesting how um, Christine Lagarde's a good example, isn't she? Somebody who's had yes. a, but she's she's a she's an example of somebody who has a presence well beyond France, not through the EU as it happens, but through international institutions. Yeah. Yes. And is liked in countries other than France. Love him or hate him, you could have said the same about Jacques Delors when he was Commission President. Um, there was plenty of place, plenty mm. of pa people that look at the, how British Labour reacted to Jacques Delors here, <laughs> True. and, that's and, and identified yeah, yeah. very strongly with him as a character and what he was mm. trying to achieve in Europe. So yeah, that's 20 years ago. So it's not, it's not the idea of there. And Britain, I con con British politicians keep saying to me, it's impossible to have politics beyond the nation state. It's just never going to happen. And I always say, have you ever been to the European Parliament? Have you ever been to Brussels? Have you ever seen battles on p maternity leave in the European Parliament where it's split? absolutely along ideological lines with all the right lining up against it and all the left lining up in favour of it and you British Conservatives lining up and voting with the right from Germany and British Labour lining up and voting with the left from all the other member states you tell me you can't have politics beyond the nation state because you're always going to be aligned as us versus them the Brits against the rest most of the governance of the single market are about setting standards and rules in a marketplace that inevitably split people along ideological lines left right um, whether you want to rep represent business or the workers, whether you're in favour of higher or lower environment standards, and so on and so on. So, so it's not impossible to think that we can create politics beyond the nation state in Europe, and we've already done that. Oh, two questions. Well, one at the back we haven't heard from, and then here, yeah. Well, that's right. I mean, can you repeat the question? I'll short the question. Take that. No, it, it, Elite. The, the, the challenge is about elite disconnect. Elite, the disconnect between the elites and the masses. I mean, I absolutely agree with that. I mean, you missed some of what I said. I showed a lot of public opinion uh, data um, and how the parties are reacting. And you know, but I think that the splits between the elites and the publics is not just a elites for a public versus Europe problem. It's a publics versus the London elites of the mm. leaderships of all the current mm. political parties. I mean, it's a much deeper problem. It's a much deeper challenge in modern democracy <coughs> of a growing gap. That, that correlates with growing economic inequality, growing inequality of economic opportunities, uh, declining social mobility, um, growing separation, or de hollowing out of party membership, and a focus on leaderships and, and voters of those parties. So, you know, I think these are generic challenges that are not just specific to the, to the problem of Europe. Okay, quick, uh, quick question. Uh, Josh, actually, hold on. Very, very quickly, and then Josh. Yep. Yeah, now I've done a lot of work in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, can you repeat? Oh, the question, question of, um, is, uh, is Europe unique? Um, are, is there a prospect of EU-type structures in other regions of the world? I mean, it's happening very rapidly. Uh, ASEAN um, in Southeast Asia has a commitment to create a single market modelled on the EU. Noticeably in the charter, they actually called it a single market consciously to 
recognised that it was a copy of the EU. Uh, I gave a lecture at LSE a few weeks ago on ASEAN and the single market in Southeast Asia, which you can watch on the LSE website. Um, and uh, West Africa, the Caribbean, Latin America are all trying to look at the EU and say, we'd like markets on a continental scale. In a globalizing world, f global free trade is not enough because free trade means a trade in a subset of goods and services. To compete globally, you need to have markets on a continental scale. You need bigger markets to be able to remain competitive, to get greater economies of scale, greater diversity of goods and services. So that's, that pressure is faced in every state in the world. The challenge, of course, is economics is pointing to you for bigger and bigger markets, and politics is pointing you to smaller and smaller mm. local decisions mm. to your local councillor. <coughs> and that's the dilemma. That's yeah. the real challenge for modern politics. How do we reconcile an economic logic pushing us to bigger and bigger markets and a political logic pointing us to smaller and smaller accountability? And they look at the EU and say, actually, the EU, or despite what you Brits might think of it, the EU has actually done pretty well in finding a way to reconcile these things. Brussels is uber checks and balances. It's very difficult to get any decisions made unless you've got overwhelming consensus in favour of it. Qualified majority amongst the governments, simple majority amongst the European Parliament, a majority in the Commission, judicial review by the European Court of Justice, oversight by national parliaments, and judicial review by national courts. Um, lots and lots of checks and balances to be able to get anything done in the way Europe works. And that has allowed Europe to build itself largely consensually in the way that it's created and regulated the market that we have within Europe. That's exactly the model they're trying to get to um, in ASEAN and some of the other regions in the world. We, very briefly, yes, yeah, we will. Very, very, very briefly. Yeah. The, the question is about, is there a long-term trend in, in, in opposition to Europe that's not just in Britain but across Europe, and, and how can that be dealt with? Um, the trend started in the, in the early... Um, uh, in the late 19, early 1990s, through 1990s and through the 2000s. Um, <coughs> and right now in the European Parliament elections in May, we're predicting that growth in support for anti-European parties across Europe. Um, it tends to be anti-European parties on the right in Northern Europe who are opposed to bailouts. So this is, uh, you know, and, the UK and immigration. So UKIP in the UK, Le Pen in France, Wilders in the Netherlands, the True Finns in Finland, the Danish People's Party in Denmark, the Alternative for Deutschland, the New Flemish Alliance in Belgium, and so on and so on. In Southern Europe, it's an anti-Europeanism on the left, who are opposed to austerity being imposed from Brussels, which is Tsipras in, in Greece, topping the polls in Greece. It's the new Tsipras list in Italy. It's the Esguerdo Unida in Spain, now up in the polls. It's the left in Portugal. And it's the new uh, Front de Gauche in France. So France both has Northern Europeans and Southern European elements of anti-Europeanism. Um, so yes, there's a sense of, and, and this, the, the, you know, I don't think this is necessarily a bad thing. This is a wake-up call to Europe's elites to say to them that you're, you're moving very, very quickly without there being public legitimacy for the project that you're now trying to build, which is deeper economic and monetary union. So put the brakes on and do this democratically um, would be more powers for national parliaments, some way of opening up the council where the governments are making decisions, and um, referendums to ratify some of the architecture that's being built would be my recommendation. If the public's opposed to it, then just don't do it. Thank you very much, Simon. Great lecture again. <laughs>